So we have to figure out a way to pay farmers to make these changes. We have to continue supporting men and women scientists and our land grant universities that can come up with solutions and make agriculture more efficient so the farmers can adopt these practices. Hello and welcome to the Farm Traveler podcast, the show for anybody curious about where their food comes from. Abraham Lincoln, the most highly regarded president in the history of the United States, has a close tie to the advancement of the agriculture industry. During the height of the Civil War, Vermont Senator Justin Morreal created a bill that would create land-grant colleges in every state. These colleges would provide engineering and agricultural education opportunities for students interested in pursuing a career in the agricultural industry. Senator Morial's bill would first be vetoed by President Buchanan before finally being signed into law by President Lincoln in 1862. Because of President Lincoln's signing of the Morial Act, the agriculture industry was able to grow tremendously thanks to higher level education provided to farmers. This led to advancements in agriculture, farming practices, technology, chemistry, biology, you name it. Land-grant colleges continue to provide students and communities with outstanding educational opportunities in the agriculture side is only a small part of the equation now. The University of Florida is one such land-grant college, and our guest on the show today is the leader of the university's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. Dr. Jack Payne is the University of Florida's Senior Vice President for Agriculture and Natural Resources and the leader of the university's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, also known as IFAS. Dr. Payne previously held positions at Iowa State, Utah State, Texas A&M, and Penn State. He also served as the National Director of Conservation for Ducks Unlimited. He has essentially served as CEO for the R&D arm of Florida's $160 billion a year agriculture and natural resource industry, the state's second largest after tourism. As one of the nation's highest ranking academic agricultural administrators, Dr. Payne has been a national leader in guarding support for the land-grant system to which the University of Florida belongs. Dr. Payne will retire this summer after presiding over a decade of remarkable growth and progress for IFAS. In our interview today, Dr. Payne will highlight his career as head of the University of Florida's IFAS, the many land-grant colleges he has worked at, and his time spent at Ducks Unlimited. Dr. Payne will also touch base on how land-grant colleges have helped improve farming across the country, and how Florida agriculture industry, and how the Florida agriculture industry manages to be one of the most diverse in the country. This is Farm Traveler Podcast, Episode 50, with Dr. Jack Payne. Right. Well, Dr. Jack Payne, thanks so much for being on the Farm Traveler podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, Trevor. I appreciate your interest in talking with me today. Absolutely. So you are the Senior Vice President of Agriculture and Natural Resources and the leader of the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. That is a pretty impressive job title. Before we kind of dive in your work with IFAS, can I tell us a little bit about your background, kind of what you did? I know you've worked at a bunch of land-grant universities, so Tell us a little bit about your background, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, I was uh, a third generation in this country and uh, first to go to college. And I mentioned that because uh, land grant universities gave me my education. And then I've been fortunate enough to work in them for 30 years now. Um, went to graduate school to land grant. My first job as an assistant professor and Five land grants later, I know it sounds like I can't hold a job, but they've all been great jobs. And uh, five year, five land grants later, 10 years ago, I came down here at the University of Florida. So I've been a faculty member at two and a vice president at three. And this job at Florida is the biggest of all of them. And it's been a real privilege for me because of the men and women who serve on the IFAS faculty. That's really neat. It, as a graduate of UF, it sounds really good that you like UF, so that's really good to hear. Can you tell us what exactly a land-grant university is? I know it was started by the famous Abraham Lincoln back in the 1800s, so can you tell us what the point of a land-grant university is? Sure. It's a great story. I, I never get tired of telling it, and I wish more people knew about it. So back in 1862, <clears throat> uh, and even before that, uh, when it first the thoughts about a land grant came to uh, fruition. Our country was still a young country, you know, it wasn't uh, more than 70, 80 years from the revolution. And our education system was based on the European system of education where only the wealthy were educated. So here we were, this new democracy, and 80% of the Americans at the time lived in rural areas and 60% of them were farmers. 
but they weren't considered the wealthy elite and they did not have an opportunity to go to college because the only colleges that existed were the private ones that are here still today and very famous, Harvard, Princeton, uh, a lot of the Ivy League schools were the original universities and catered to the elite. And so there was this congressman from Vermont by the name of Justin Morrill, M-O-R-R-I-L-L, who said, you know, <clears throat> if we're a democracy, everybody should have the opportunity to get educated. And there was a second thing that was making him uh, look at this. We were right, if you remember the time, uh, recall the time in history, it was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and most of America was tied up in farming, and we needed to free up people for the factories that were being built. So his idea, and this is why it's called land grant, is for the federal government to give every state 30,000 acres of federal land per member of Congress. So if you're from a state that had, say, for sake of argument, three members of Congress, the government gave your state 90,000 acres of land. And the purpose of it was to sell the land and use the proceeds to build a people's university or use some of that land to build a university on that land. And so that's why they call it land grant, because it was actually a, a gift from the federal government. Now we think of the Western United States with all the federal lands, but most of the country at the time had a lot of federal land. And it was deeded to the states to build this university. And it revolutionized education in America and even the world. And... Um, gave the opportunity for uh, all these uh, new Americans in our new country to go to school. So, so Justin Morrill put the bill together. It went up through uh, to the president, got past Congress. President Buchanan, who preceded Lincoln, uh, didn't he vetoed it, he didn't sign it. So Morrill then went from being a congressman to a senator from Vermont and Lincoln gets elected. And this is why it's so cool. It's 1862. We're in the middle of the Civil War. Washington is surrounded by Confederate troops. The Washington Monument is only half built, and it was called the Beef Depot because that's where the government kept all the cattle that was feeding the Union troops that were protecting Washington. And Lincoln has the presence of mind to sign this legislation into law, revolutionizing education for our country. And so I, I think about today and all the disharmony in Congress and probably this would have a chance in hell of ever getting passed and signed off, but it happened. And at the same same time he signed this, he signed the Nas National Railroad Act, which really colonized Western United States and the Homestead Act, which allowed people to go get a section of land and, and grow food and be a farmer. So a lot happened in 1862, but the Land Grant Act is, is what made it famous, but it didn't end there. So here's this opportunity for people to go to school, but at the same time, you know, they're trying to make agriculture more efficient because as I said, 60% of the 80% of the population that lived in rural areas were working on farms and we needed to make farming more efficient and free up people. So in 18, uh, it was 1882, 1862 was the Land Grant Act, and then 1882 they created the Hatch Act, and that created the Agriculture Experiment Station, which every land grant university has. And that was uh, money from the federal government to these land grants to give opportunities to do agriculture research to make farming more productive, to make it better, to make it more efficient. And so things are going along well. And there is a third part of this act and didn't happen until 1917. And that's called the Smith Lever Act that created the Cooperative Extension Service. And the purpose of that was to take all this new knowledge now that was being created at these land grant universities. And how do we get it out to the people who can't go to college to help spread the knowledge and the science? And that's how the extension service got started. So in every state in our country, there's a land grant university and they have the extension service, which is an office in every county in America. So they, and they're all employed by the university. So in Florida, we have 67 counties. We have 67 county agent offices. And these are men and women. We require a master's degree. Some of them have doctorates. 
and they take the knowledge that is created through the experiment station out to the people. So anybody can walk into a county agent office in that county and ask for help. Most of it is in agriculture, natural resources, uh, family, youth, and communities. 4-H is a national youth program that's headquartered in land grant universities delivered by extension. Uh, so it's like a it's like a free consulting service. So the way it works, say if uh, you're growing corn and something's eating your corn and you don't know what it is. So you call your county agent out and it's all free. They come out and they'll say nine times out of 10, they'll say, oh, this is such and such a problem. Uh, say, for example, it's an insect and here's how you fix it. Or they may say, I never saw that before. Well, back on the campus of the land grant, if it's an insect problem in the etymology department is a faculty member who's called not a county agent, but an extension specialist. And he or she is a faculty member, just like anybody that taught you here at University of Florida. But instead of being split between research and teaching, they're split between research and extension. And they're the experts for that specific area. So they, that etymology professor, if, again, if it's an insect problem, works with that county agent to solve the problem for that landowner. So expand that idea across any question you might have in agriculture or natural resources or community development. And that's what land grant universities do. They have now grown since 1862 into the major public research university of the United States. So University of Wisconsin, Texas A&M, University of Minnesota, MIT was a land grant, Berkeley was a land grant. Now California is a system and they're all like related. So they took their land grant mission and divided it up in three campuses, Berkeley, UC Davis, and UC Riverside. Uh, but everybody else just has one campus like Texas A&M, University of Georgia, Auburn's the one in Alabama, Mississippi State is the one in Mississippi, and, and University of Florida is the one here. So they're very special schools and they really have built the United States and they continue to do so today. Yeah, it sounds like um, the whole land grant university with the Morrell with the Morrell Act has had just such a huge impact. I mean, not only providing educational opportunities for for people, but also in providing I mean education to farmers, in, no matter what community or county you're in. I mean, if they have a problem, they can go get some free advice from a land grant university from the Extension Service. That's really cool. What are some things that you're proud of that um, the University of Florida's IFAS has done while during your tenure there? Well, gosh, there, there's so much because you know the uh, agriculture, as you probably know, Trevor, in Florida is, is put around $140 billion. And we, and we, because we're the only game in town with there's 12 research universities, we're, we're the only land grant. We, we like to think of ourselves uh, as the research and innovation arm of Florida agriculture. So, and, and we're also a specialty crop state as opposed to a commodity state. Like my last job was at Iowa State. So that's the number one corn breeding corn growing state in the country, number one soybean growing state in the country, and they feed the world. But once you get past corn and soybeans, you got it made. Here, we have over 300 crops. And so what that means is if we're the research and innovation arm of, of that industry, we have a very diverse faculty. So there's so many things to be proud of. We have, for example, more plant breeders than any College of Agriculture, United States, California is second, because that's also a specialty crop state like Florida, but they divide up their plant breeding among three different campuses. So what does that mean in terms of what I'm most proud of stuff? Well, you know, when, when I was a kid, you could only buy blueberries, for example, out of uh, Northern states like Michigan. But our plant breeders looked at that and developed varieties over time that could survive in humidity and heat and, and soil type we have in Florida, where today, because of the University of Florida IFAS, 98% of all the varieties of blueberries that grow in Florida for in production agriculture, we developed. And this year it was an $80 million business. Same could be said for strawberries. We have some of the best strawberry breeders in the world and that's a half a billion, $500 million a year business, and 80% of the varieties of strawberries are grown in the state, we developed. 
So, you know, and, and, you know, we're the iconic industry is citrus. We have huge challenges there. And uh, for citrus growers that have gone out of business and they want to stay in farming, we're working on things that you never heard of before in Florida, pomegranates, olives, peaches. Now, some of these are ready for prime time. Some of them are still in development. We're even developing varieties of hops. You know, hops come out of like Czechoslovakia or Canada, states like Montana and Washington. We've actually grown hops in Florida and we continue to work on different varieties uh, that, and in fact, First Magnitude Brewery in, in, in uh, Gainesville actually uh, made a lager out of one of our crops, but we're not ready for prime time yet. But these are things that I'm very proud of in that uh, we're at the cutting edge, keeping our $140 billion agriculture uh, innovative and competitive, given all the other policy challenges we have. And I'll just say on top of that, we have a growing and very large international footprint where we're working in many parts of the world in both ag and natural resources. And as an example, um, we, IFAS, outcompeted 40 other land-grant universities and won the USAID competition for what we call the Livestock Innovation Lab. It's a $49.5 million project to develop livestock capacity in six African countries and two in Southeast Asia. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation a couple of months ago dropped eight and a half million on top of that. So it's a $57 million research project. And it's not trying to get people to be, you know, cowboys, cattlemen. It's that, you know, we eat a lot of red meat in the Western world, but these countries you're working in, they don't have any meat in their diets at all. And stunting in the brains of children is a huge problem in these countries. And if you don't address it by the time they're two years old, it's permanent. So basically what we're trying to do through this project is get animal protein in um, the diet of nursing mothers and these young children to prevent this terrible scourge that's happening throughout some like Ethiopia and other countries. So it's a, uh, I'm very proud of it's, it's the men and women faculty of life is that are actually changing the world. That sounds so cool. And yeah, you, you hit on a really good note that Florida is just so diverse when it comes to agriculture. I mean, we've got, you know, we're, we're popular, we're very famous for oranges, strawberries and all that stuff, but people don't know that we have a lot of aquaculture going on. We have a lot of plant, plant breeders here and that we also have a large amount of beef cow, beef cow operations here in Florida. So it's really cool that Florida is so diverse. I mean, do you see that as a result of our climate or of our diverse population? What do you see that as a result of? Well, it's basically uh, our, our climate, uh, the uh, diverse soil types we have that allows us to uh, look at all those uh, different things. The, commod the five commodities that the country always supported through the Farm Bill until recently are uh, cotton, wheat, rice, soybeans, and uh, uh, what am I forgetting? Cotton, rice, wheat, soybeans, and corn. That's the major crops of the United States. The Farm Bill up till 2010 always uh, supported them. And then basically through the work of Florida stakeholders, we got the specialty crop initiative. And now some of the Farm Bill money goes to states like Florida, California, uh, Washington for apples, Michigan for apples. So um, it's really uh, the climate and the soil type that lends itself where the commodities do not do well here. Uh, we have a little sweet corn, we have a little cotton, but um, we don't, we, we can't support those large commodities like Iowa and the Midwest can. I've heard that you've kind of started a conversation among Florida producers about kind of the ag commodities and how they can respond to climate change. I mean, anytime you watch the news, you hear more and more about climate change and kind of the impact we're having on the planet. So what can you tell me about that? Like, what have you been telling producers about what they can do to still produce commodities, but kind of have a smaller impact on climate change? That's a great question. And it's been a big challenge. Um, and it's been a slow adaptation, but it's becoming more and more apparent as we go down the road. So, you know, somebody in my position, people ask me all the time, you know, what's your opinion, Jack? And my answer is, it's not my job to give you my opinion. My job is to tell you what the science says. And so I try to stick to that. I'm even registered independent because I work with both Republicans and Democrats in Tallahassee and in Washington, DC. 
And my job is this is what the science says and let the policymakers take truth as we know it through science and hopefully make the right decisions. Now, unfortunately, if the science says something that one party doesn't agree with, then it becomes you're, you know, you're, you're supporting the other party. Well, no, I'm not. I'm just telling you what the research says. So when I first got down here and you know, tried to talk to agriculture about climate change, it was very political. And um, it, was, it was a hard discussion. But as we continue to see uh, Florida being the uh, really the, the bullseye for sea level rise in our country, you know, the seas around the Florida coast are rising half an inch a year and have been for a number of years now. And uh, that'll increase unless we can limit CO2. And so um, farmers started asking me because they're seeing impacts on their production. You know, how can University of Florida IFAS help? My staff and I put together a group of farmers and worked with an NGO uh, out of Maryland called Solutions from the Land. Uh, we talked to them because they were successful in working with producers in states like Iowa, Missouri, Ohio, North Carolina, said that, you know, if we can get thought leaders to at least listen to us as scientists and not get into the politics, but talk about what's happening with their operations and see if we can work with them to develop adaptation um, and a strategic plan so that maybe we'll be able to protect the future of agriculture in Florida. And uh, I didn't have much hope, but started talking to people. And I, I was really impressed that my first meeting just a year ago, we had around 18 to 20 of some of the leading producers in Florida. And it was uh, really impressive. I, they, I brought them up for a Friday night dinner to campus. And then Saturday morning, I put some of my faculty who work on climate change issues in front of them to talk about not the politics, but the research. This is what our research shows. And it was a turning point when one of the biggest blueberries growers in the state stood up and said, I just want Jack and everybody here to know I am not a flag waving human caused climate change guy. But Something is definitely happening out there and it's impacting my business. And I want to learn about it. That was huge. That was, that was a, a, that was a big change in the mindset. And then we talked to this group at the end of the day and a half and said, what do you want to do next? Do you want to continue? And every hand went up and I said, well, if we're going to be successful, this can't be a university led program. It has to be led by farmers farmers, foresters, and cattlemen, people that have rangelands or, or produce, production ag lands uh, or foresters. And they agreed. And fortunately, uh, two of, of our leading producers in the state who have great credentials that nobody could argue with, Lynetta Griner, who was the Florida Ag Woman of the Year about five years ago, and a couple years ago, she was the Southeast U.S. Farmer of the Year. Um, she runs a cattle and timber operation out of Chiefland. And Jim Strickland, who's past president of the Florida Cattlemen's Association, who uh, runs a cattle operation in South Central Florida, they said, we'll co-chair this. And so uh, people in the ag business looks at those two and they're leaders and they, and they are listening probably more than they would to somebody like me and it's growing. And uh, so we had a second meeting a few months later and it was about twice as big. And then Representative Kathy Castor out of Tampa, a Congresswoman who uh, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, recently appointed to chair the U.S. House Committee, Select Committee on Climate Change, called me up and said, hey, I heard about this group. Can I talk to some of the producers? And she spent a day with us talking to farmers, ranchers and foresters in Florida about what they're experiencing with changing conditions and why it's making harder harder for them to make a living. So while all this was happening, the uh, third IPCC report came out and for the first time, which is a global report on climate change and for the first time really attacked uh, agriculture as a significant contribution contributor of greenhouse gases 
something like a 30% contribution from agriculture. In the United States, it's not that bad. We're about 9% contributing and 11% sequestering. So we're still on the positive side. But the point was the whole world's struggling to grow more food to feed this huge increase in population expected by 2050, some nine to 10 billion people. And to do so with traditional agriculture that exists today, we'll have to clear land the size of two Indias to make it work. Well, then you're just accelerating all the problems that ag may be causing with climate change. So we need a more efficient agriculture and we need to figure out a way to pay farmers to do it. So for example, Chuck Oburn is a farmer down by the Everglades. He's a big cilantro grower. Uh, He was farmer of the year this year, by the way, uh, Southeast farmer of the year and uh, of the United States. And he admits it. He says, you know, Jack, I need to lower my carbon footprint. I'm part of the problem. I'm totally run on diesel. It'll cost me over $200,000 to to go from diesel to electricity. I can't afford that. So we have to figure out a way to pay farmers to make these changes. We have to continue supporting men and women scientists and our land grant universities that can come up with solutions and make agriculture more efficient so the farmers can adopt these practices. And third, Trevor, third, we got to protect farmland, in Florida especially. A thousand people a day moving to the state. It's been going on for years. So how do we do that? And uh, that's what this group's talking about. You know, we're talking about trying to get legislators, legislators aware that farmers, ranchers, and foresters produce ecosystem services for free that make our quality of life what it is. You know, they you, you look at a, a forest stand and what it does with rainwater, a rainstorm and filtrate, filtering it through the soil to the aquifer as opposed to a strip mall. And all these lands and what they do for pollination and wildlife habitat. I was up on Lake Michigan this summer and it's the highest level ever recorded in the history of uh, that lake. And I said, is that because of increased rainfall? And they said, no, it's because of increased paved surfaces and runoff. Uh, what are we losing? So to the aquifer for drinking water, all the things you use water for. So all these things add to our quality of life. And if we can get recognition for our ag producers that, that they provide now for free, maybe we can help them with the changes they have to make to stay in business as as sea level rise and climate change becomes a bigger problem down the road. So sorry, I hope, I hope that was too long an answer. No, 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 that's perfect. Yeah, I always get kind of annoyed when when people that are that believe in climate change think it's all because of ag or like no, most time nine times out of ten uh-huh. they'll say it's all because of big ag. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, we've got to make sure that farmers can do what they can to provide us with enough food. But I mean, like especially here in Florida, so many people are moving in, and a lot of that farmland is being converted into condos or to apartments, and so. I mean, we've all got to do a better job of protecting our climate and reducing our impact on it, regardless if we're in agriculture or if we're in agriculture. So those are some very good points. Well, you bring up a really good point. It really gets me upset over red tide and blue, uh, blue-green blue algae or harmful algae. You know, I, agriculture gets beat up all the time over this because, yes, we use fertilizer and the work we do at the University of Florida, we're helping uh, farmers grow crops that require less fertilizer, less water every day. But it's not just agriculture. It's everybody, as you said. It's the thousand people moving a day to Florida. It's uncontrolled subdivision development. It's septic tank leakage, which is a huge issue for our waterways. Everybody wants a lawn. Everybody wants a green lawn. That fertilizer goes into the watershed. So you're absolutely right. It's everybody. It's our lifestyle. It's not agriculture. Exactly. We all have got to play an equal part in reducing our, our impact. We So it was like right after, I think it was 2019, right after like the big algae bloom in South Florida, my wife and I were out to dinner one night and there was this random tourist that was talking about the algae bloom. And she was like, oh yeah, it's all these Florida farmers dumping all of their um, nutrients into the water. And I was like, that's not how it works. First off. And she just was going on and on. And my wife was telling me so much. She was like, do not get into an argument with them. I was like, I, but I want to tell them that they're wrong. Good for you. Good for you, buddy. <laughs> so, so how can people, and kind of going off of this, I know we've all got to do a, a better part in helping the ag industry and helping reduce our impact on the climate. So how can people help the University of Florida's IFAS Institute for Food and Agricultural Sciences, how can they help IFAS assist the Florida agriculture industry? Well, first of all, people need to know and pay attention when they buy food where it comes from. USMCA, which is you know the new NAFTA, does not help Florida growers. 
Uh, the, the competition with Mexico on strawberries, blueberries, tomatoes is really significant. And so it's, uh, if, if, if you buy your blueberries from a Florida grower instead of uh, having been imported from Mexico, strawberries, tomatoes, you're, you're helping the industry out. And you're actually promoting a, you know, a better quality of life for all of us because people drive around the state and they see all the beautiful land. They don't realize this is private ag land. These are people that are making a living off the land. And uh, so to know where your food comes and buy local is important. Um, you really need to get people to understand uh, and work with their legislature to support the agricultural research that's done at these land grant universities. These are public entities that exist from the annual work that's done in Tallahassee and in Washington, D.C. And unfortunately, over the last number of years, the state and federal governments haven't lived up to the promise of the land grant mission, uh, not just land grants, but all public institutions. And, you know, nobody wants to pay taxes, but if you're going to have these services, you have to pay taxes. We have to pay a certain amount, and we need to support the faculty and the research that's going on at these land grant universities. They have the knowledge and can come up with the solutions. As I mentioned before, we are the research and innovation arm of a $140 billion business. If a thousand people moving a day in an urban state, you know, we elect people now from those urban areas that don't understand agriculture, where the food comes from. They don't understand the importance of land grant university. So somehow we have to better educate people. And with the lack of support from, from uh, state and federal government today compared to what it used to be, uh, philanthropy is becoming more important. Uh, every university has a development program. We have one in IFAS. People that benefit from IFAS are really great about giving, uh, donating money, gifts. So, you know, we have hundreds of funds from graduate student assistantships to scholarships to endowed faculty positions that uh, really help get this uh, knowledge, uh, new science done and the knowledge distributed to the people that need it. And I would say vote for candidates <clears throat> in the legislature that uh, understand the importance of agriculture and, and who support higher education. If you're a grower, um, if, if you're making a living from agriculture, it's, it's always good to have your state representative come over to your place put on a, a field day uh, we're glad to participate from MIFIS. i've i've gone to a lot of them um it's important to get to know these legislators you know they come and go uh, they don't stay in office forever and so it's a constant constant education process but there's some of the things that uh, people in the state can do to help us with uh with the future of ag one thing I like to ask all of our guests, the, the relationship between the farmer and the consumer. So you've had a really good career in several states working particularly to help farmers do the best they can and kind of to help bridge the gap between farmers and consumers. So how have you seen that relationship change during your career? Unfortunately, Trevor, I've seen it get bigger because of all the uh, false information that gets out there on the internet. You know, there's a lot of great things that have come out with social media and the internet, but uh, it's really hard to decide what's what truth is. And so just take GMOs, for example. Um, for those of us that understand the science of GMOs, understand plant breeding, traditional plant breeding, it, it takes years to uh, you know look at different plants or animals and go through the traditional sexual reproduction and look at the offspring and breed them. And you have to wait these long periods of of uh, the uh, breeding occurs to come up with new varieties. Well, GMO is just a scientific way of taking it into the laboratory and uh, making it so much faster and uh, more reliable because it's a controlled environment. And uh, you're not gonna be able to feed the world unless we have biotechnology, but it's been so abused and people have been misled so much that, um, it, 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 things that don't even have a GMO aspect to it, marketing companies put it on their food packages and it doesn't make sense. So, and nothing wrong with organic. You know, we do research in organic too. It's a lot more expensive if you're a food buyer, but you know, people should have the right to buy what they want. 
But I, I think that there's been so much misinformation out there on food labeling, on uh, on on uh, what biotechnology uh, does and does not do, that the gap is increased. In fact, today, I think uh, the consumer is so much more in control of what will be purchased that companies kind of bend to those winds and aren't necessarily producing what might be the best nutritious thing, but what's going to sell. You know, there's way too much sugar in our diet. Um, we're a country of processed foods today. Um, you know, anybody that's spent time in other countries, especially, you know, countries like France and Italy, South America, you know, uh, very rare to find processed foods, but not in our country. It's, uh, and that's not the healthiest food, you know, and that tends to lead to problems with obesity and type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes used to be a disease of old people. Now it's a disease of young people. Because every kid's walking around with a big gulp in their hand and eating processed food. So um, I don't think our, the public is well educated today on what good nutrition is because there's so much information out there. And uh, we have to do a better job. And the poor farmer, I think, is, uh, has been lost in, in, in the discussion. Those are all really good thoughts. Yeah, I think when it comes to food labeling, that that is a really big danger there. I mean, like you were talking about, there are things that have non-GMO, but they have no GMO ingredients on it. I saw one a few days ago. It was a can of tuna, and it was it was tuna in water, not t- not tuna in oil, and it said non-GMO. I'm like, all right, well, of course, there's no GMO t- GMO tuna. So it's just all this crazy labeling that just, I mean, makes consumers want to buy a product. So. Um, well, you know, I, it- it's a statistic like five and a half million, I think it is, children under the age of 12 die every year from starvation, food insecurity. No one has ever been documented of dying from eating a GMO. Mm-hmm. And what has happened with uh, golden rice that can prevent blindness in children being held up by these uh, groups that are anti-biotechnology is, is immoral. Yeah, exactly. We had Dr. Kevin Fult on a few months ago from the University of Florida, and um, he was talking about the Matoke banana and how it can cure the deficiencies over in Africa. But there, I think the country, I think it's, I can't remember, I think it's Uganda, but because they are following the European model about not allowing GMOs, that the kids aren't having um, the bananas to help eliminate their deficiency. And so the, pro- the solution to their problem is there, but because people are afraid of biotech and are misinformed, it's not getting out there to save the kids. So it's very crazy. Yeah, I'm very familiar with Kevin. He's one of my uh, outstanding uh, horticulture professors, and I worked a lot with him. Yeah, he was a really good guest. I was really excited to have him on. So you are retiring soon, a very long, very accomplished career. Um, do you know who will replace you next as the head of IFAS? No, uh, but I do know uh, there's been a national search, and uh, they've identified – Four finalists. Uh, the good news is they all are what's considered uh, what I am, an administrative head at a land grant university, um, or have had experience as an administrative head at a land grant university. So they understand the importance of land grant. They understand the importance of agriculture. Uh, they know what extension is and how important those men and women out in our county offices are. Uh, so I feel good. I feel good about it because. You know, I look back at my 10 years here and so many wonderful things happened that I got a chance to see because of our faculty and staff. But what I'm most proud of, uh, most proud of are the men and women I hired in the administrative positions of department chairs, center directors, all the deans that I've hired. And so I think about whoever it is that comes in after me um, and you know, like a proud parent, you know, I want them to hire somebody smarter than me that can take IFAS to the next level, but whoever it is, I know, uh, I jokingly say it'll be a turnkey operation because of this great team that we've been able to assemble here. They're just outstanding men and women professionals, and I'm very proud of them, and it's been a real privilege for me to have a chance to work with them and see them do great things. Well, that's very good to hear. It sounds like no matter who takes over your position, it sounds like IFAS is going to be in good hands because of the leadership and just because of all the people involved with it. Um, so is there anything in particular that you're looking forward to in retirement? 
<laughs> well, if you listen to my wife, she wants to go to Italy and have me take uh, cooking lessons and live in Tuscany for a while. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm going to be in Kenya in April. I was there. Uh, I have a background in wildlife ecology, and um, I was fascinated by the Impala Research Station, uh, which is 50,000 acres owned by the Smithsonian and uh, Princeton University, also the Kenyan Wildlife Agency, the Kenyan National Museum. And the wildlife there are unbelievable, surrounded by 200,000 acres of private ranch land, no fences. I can't walk outside of your cabin at night because the lions and leopards are walking around. But um, I'm fascinated by that. They've invited me to come back uh, for a while. I'm, uh, in April, I'm just going to visit. But I mean, next year after I leave the position, they've invited me back. I don't know. Um, and I live in Cedar Key. <clears throat> I moved there six years ago which is a you know, wonderful little island 50 miles southwest of Gainesville on the Gulf of Mexico. And, and to get up in the morning and see roseate spoonbills and wood storks in my backyard uh, brings a lot of peace uh, to who I am and, and uh, how much I enjoy the natural world. So I expect uh, just spending time in my flats boat in Cedar Key will be a big part of it. That sounds like a pretty good retirement plan. I like that, especially the Italy part. <laughs> Jealous of that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've, well, I've, I've, try, I've, I've been trying for two years to be a better chef, and so that's where she's getting this idea. Well, there you go. You'll have plenty of time to practice it. I'm sure you'll open up a restaurant or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but that's something to think about. <laughs> there you go. Well, Dr. Payne, this has been so cool uh, talking with you and talking about your work with IFAS and what all you've done. Um, thank you so much for all that you've done for the, for the University of Florida and for IFAS and just for Florida Ag in general. We wish you a great retirement. I know it's well-deserved, and we will be in touch. Thanks again for being on the podcast and sharing all your wisdom. Well, you're very welcome, Trevor. And keep the blog going, man. We need to educate the people about agriculture. And for me, it's been a real privilege, especially to work with men and women that make a living off the land. Thank you. Well, absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, we'll talk to you soon. Hello. Thanks so much for listening. To learn more about IFAS, if you're in Florida, check out ifas.ufl.edu. Or, you know, if you're in another state, simply find out what that college's land-grant university is. Just type in your state, land-grant college, and you will find it. And you will find all the really cool stuff that those organizations can do for you. Don't forget, share with your friends, share with your family. Thanks, and we will see you in the next episode.